2 Timothy chapter 2. Timothy was the pastor of the church of Ephesus. We know a little bit about his background. His mother and grandmother were believers. His father was, uh, and his mother and grandmother were Jews and who came, became believers. His father was a Greek, and as far as we know, not a believer. But the, uh, his wife, or Timothy's mother and Timothy's grandmother, poured the scriptures into young Timothy. And when the apostle Paul came, Uh, into the area where he grew up and started telling about Jesus Christ, he finally made a commitment. And Paul often referred to Timothy as my own son in the faith. So Timothy was a man that grew up, as far as we know, without a godly father. He became the pastor of the church of Ephesus, and Paul is writing the book of 1 and 2 Timothy, mostly giving him instructions about how to be a man and how to particularly be a, a, a... effective pastor and leader of the church. Pick up reading with me in chapter 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is implying that if Timothy or any other pastor can't find faithful men, what will happen to the next generation? Who's going to teach them how to be a man? It goes on to say, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a, uh, to be a soldier. I want to talk to you this morning about fathers in particular, but this, this context of, as Bible often refers to uh, warfare, The most epic books or movies that become popular in our culture today almost always have a common theme about good and evil. Some of the ones more recently, of course, The Lord of the Rings. One that most people don't know, it's not a movie, it's a book, happens to be one of my favorite books, called The Edge of Eternity, in which a father, frankly a deadbeat dad, an immoral man, an adulterous man who was about to, his family had finally left them, and I'm tempted to go into the theme of the book, but I won't, but... He want, he's trying to kill himself, and God doesn't let him kill himself, but God takes him on a journey right to the edge of eternity and helps him to see his life as it is and as it can be. And through this journey, Nick comes to grip with reality, but through most of the journey, the book, it's, it's an allegory, things are confusing. Uh, this picture, I know you can't see it very well, but there's a ship that's sunk, and there's a handful of, of sailors and I don't know if they're, they're female as well as passengers who are trying to find safety. But what they can't see, and you can't see unless someone points it out to you, is there's more at stake here. In the, in the one hand, where the light is, there's an army of light fighting an army of darkness. And the reality is the sailors may never even know that their, their shipwreck has spiritual dimensions. The reality is most of us live day to day unaware of the spiritual battle. In this book, and one of the reasons it's my fa- one of my favorite books, The Edge of Eternity, is Nick, in this journey, sometimes the lights come on. Sometimes he sees clearly. Sometimes he recognizes what's really going on behind the scenes, and, and he realizes things are not always as they appear. But you know, those times are limited. And then they go back where the veil is pulled again, and life is deceitful and deceptive. And, and he forgets for a while what he really saw when the lights came on. And that's our world. Occasionally, God will speak truth to our heart. And we begin to see clearly. But then those moments, I call them defining moments. The curtains close. Life rushes in. The devil and the world. In fact, the Bible uses the word cosmos to describe the world. Love not the world, cosmos. You know what cosmos means in the Greek of the New Testament? It means decoration. Not substance, decoration. Just on the surface. Sometimes we can see beneath the surface at what's really going on, but most of the time the world is full of decorations and distractions. God often describes, as he does in this passage we read, and many other places, the world as a battlefield with spiritual connotations. And the Bible tells us very clearly, those of us that are believers, we're we're in enemy territory. 
Ephesians chapter 2 says, we, we all, at one point, the world walks according to the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Colossians says, we, when we get saved, are delivered from the power, influence of Satan and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. But we're still behind enemy lines. That's why Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, no man that warreth entangles himself in the affairs of this life. Why? Because he's behind enemy lines. He's on mission. And we're on mission for our commander-in-chief. But since most people are unaware of this, the nature of these spiritual battles, we're unprepared. And, if we're un- and though many are unprepared, none are unaffected. We are all affected by what's really going on, whether we recognize it or not. And of course, one, one moment after we die, everything will be clear. But then it will be too late. The first time the word command, which obviously is a military term. How many of you were in the military, by the way? You understood what a command was, right? It wasn't a suggestion. It used to be our children understood what a command was. Do children understand what a command is today? No. The first time the word command is found in the Bible is in the context of fatherhood. God says of Abraham, which by the way, his name was changed from Abram to Abraham, which means a father of a multitude. First time the word command is found is right here. God says he's about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham's nephew lives there. So God says, shall I hide from Abraham that which I'm about to do, seeing that I know him? He will command his children and his household after him, and they will keep the way of the Lord. And if you read the next passage, part of the scripture, it says, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he's spoken. In other words, there are conditions to the blessing of Abraham's descendants, and I know Abraham is going to teach his children, and if they will embrace that truth, I will be able to bless his children. My lesson this morning, and I'm only going to introduce it, I realize I can't possibly do this in one message, is helping us to understand that in the context of this battle of spiritual warfare, God has commissioned the Father to act as the point man. Many people don't understand, unless you've been in the military, what a point man is. So I want to first of all define what a point man is in military terms and and make an analysis of how that affects us spiritually. The point man is the military, uh, in the military, is a soldier in charge of a relatively small unit. There may be a company of a hundred or a thousand, but the point man goes, is an advanced team leading a smaller team through enemy territory to make sure that he's found a safe route to move the whole unit. You can move a unit of five easier and more stealthily than you can lead an army of a a, a unit of 500. So a point man is assigned to go find the safe way for the battalion or the troops to follow. That means he's the one that's going to find the booby traps and the landmines and anybody that's sitting in is sitting out there waiting to ambush his whole unit. And there's always one man that goes first. In this case, the danger in spiritual warfare is so much different. We can understand. I had a man in my last church, Tommy, uh, who was a mind sw- He was that guy. He was that guy that would go out and, and, and check for booby traps and, and mines. I had another man in my first church. He was a ranger. And he was the point man for his ranger team back in Vietnam. And they would always be the first team that would go in a, a Viet Cong village to find out if there's danger. And often the danger was so disguised. He would tell me stories about villagers, women coming and holding their babies out to to his soldiers. And some of them would grab the babies and hold them and then they would blow up. The mothers would leave grenades. Could you imagine the danger? This is way back before people understood post-traumatic stress disorder. But that's the job of the point men to kind of flush out the danger because not only is the five or six men behind him depending on his wisdom, but the five or six hundred men they're going to follow their paths are depending on them. So the danger in spiritual warfare is much more difficult because the enemy we face is much more dangerous and the consequences of whether we succeed or fail are not just death or imprisonment, they, they are eternal. They may have eternal implications. So my message this morning is really an introduction. I want to cause us to begin to change our paradigm. 
change the way we look. How does our culture view fatherhood today? Is it any different than it was maybe in the 50s or 60s? How were fathers presented even on television in the 50s and 60s? Respectful, leave it to beaver, father knows best. How were fathers portrayed today? If they're portrayed as all, at all, they're portrayed as imbeciles. So how can we recognize God's challenge to us? Now, whether we choose to do it, how many have ever seen a mission impossible? Your mission, whether or not you choose to accept it. Here's my point. Fathers, we have a mission from God. We don't have to accept it, but we, I, I want to challenge you to consider the consequences if we fail either to accept this mission or to use the resources God has given us to safely lead our family unit in a healthy direction because we are surrounded by forces that seek to destroy. Jesus said the thief, who's the devil, who God also calls the God of this world, he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Most of us can look around, and we don't have to look very far to see evidences that he's doing that in our own families. What is the job of appointment? For two, two points I'm going to make this morning by way of introduction. How can we be better prepared to be effective appointment? I'm speaking specifically to fathers, but some of you aren't fathers now, but you will be, and every one of you have a father. So I want to help you to understand how you can encourage him. First of all, we need to accept our responsibility. And, and I there are many responsibilities, but there's only two I want to talk about this morning. First of all, it's to lead. Someone's got to take the lead. God's pattern is very clear. Ephesians chapter 5, in the context of the husband and wife relationship, it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, be in submission to your own husbands, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He, hear me carefully, he is the savior of the body. Now, it's comparing the husband to Christ, pretty poor analogy, isn't it? Gentlemen, can we look in the mirror? Can we look in our heart and say, wow. But that's the responsibility we have. We're supposed to mirror Christ's love to our family, and we're supposed to reflect Christ's leadership in our home. If Christ is the Savior, sotir is the Greek word. It means protector, deliverer of the body, and we're supposed to love and lead like Christ led. What does that say God expects us to do for our family? Are we not supposed to be the one to protect and deliver our family from the dangers around them? First Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul talks about his love for the, for the church of Thessalonica, and he says, we exhorted and comforted, and uh, I'm tempted to talk about what all these words mean, but I'll never get very far if I do. We exhort, we challenged you, we comforted you, we counseled you, we charged you, we got in your face, even as a father doth his children. What Paul is saying is a father is supposed to exhort, a father is supposed to comfort, a father is supposed to charge. Why? Because he's under orders. That you would walk worthy of God who hath called you to his kingdom and his glory. I am not a Facebook person. I had a Facebook. I, I wanted to keep in touch with my kids, so I opened a Facebook. I don't have a picture there. My birthday's wrong, and I get on about once a year whether I need to or not. My wife is a Facebook person. And she regularly, while we're driving or I'm walking into another room, oh, look at this, Keith. And occasionally, it's not just a cute cat or a dog. It's something that really is meaningful. And I said, can you send me that? And this was one of them. This was a Facebook post, and this is the title of the post. While unpopular these days, this is still God's order. I like the idea of an umbrella because we're in a storm. We're in a spiritual storm. The Bible tells us, uh, and by the way, I read this, and I agree with this because it's accurate and it's biblical, but I started to read the post. I almost never read posts on, I mean, replies. I was alarmed. 90% of the replies were negative. Many of them came from men. Why would a man say, I don't want to be the leader of my family? Why would a man want to do that? Because they don't want to be the leader of their family because it's too much responsibility. I was shocked at how the, particularly the young women, I mean, profane, angry, the language, you can look it up and read it for yourself. The language was 
wow, this hit a nerve. But it's true. I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee. The word submit is a military term in the Bible. It's hupo, hupo tasso. I got an email from a gal years ago when, when she had heard this teaching and her husband had heard that teaching and he had been doing this and she's, she wrote, you know, Pastor Keith, can you explain what this hupo tasso is? Because my husband calls it the hupo tasso lasso. <laughs> it's not about tying somebody up. But hupo means under and tasso means in order. And it's a military term that you're supposed to be subordinate to the authority above you. What happens if there are no authorities? I, was, I, I had mentioned in Sunday school, I was an expert witness at a, at a trial. It was a horrible experience. And it was a female lawyer. And, and before I even had a chance to say it, I have a PhD. I was called to, to, about family issues and alienation of affection. And this female lawyer said, I'll bet you're one of those who believe a woman should be submissive. First word she said out of her mouth. I'm thinking, where is this? What's this got to do with anything? And, and what I told her is, you know, in this courtroom, the man right there is the authority, the judge. It doesn't mean he's better than us, but let's assume that we don't acknowledge his authority and everybody in this room believes they're the judge and they're the ones that, that keeps order in the, in the courtroom. What would happen? And the reality is that's what happened in the book of Judges. It says several times, because there was no authority, everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. God has established an order of authority. And that master plan involves the Father. And here's the problem. We're not like Christ very often, are we men? We fail, we mess up. In our fa- <laughs> Does our family know it when we screw up? Yes? And Satan uses our past. The word Satan means accuser. He uses our screw-ups to whisper, you have no right to lead. And we let our past keep us from stepping up and being men. Don't let your past, now if it's present sin and shame, deal with it. But don't let your past mistakes stop you from leading your family. They don't need a perfect father. Those don't exist except our father in heaven. But what they do need is a dad who can lead them and say, let me tell you about who I'm trying to follow. But what happens if dad is not following our heavenly father? Where's he leading the people around him? So accept your responsibility to lead. And I know I'm just touching on this briefly. And accept your responsibility to love. Lead and love. Can we remember that? Men say after me, I'm responsible to lead. And I'm responsible to love. Husbands right after it says, wives be in submission to your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church should be subject to Christ in all things, so should the wife to the husband. Then it says, husbands, love your wives. Not just lead like Christ, love like Christ. Love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. And how do you demonstrate love? Gave himself for it goes on to say, husbands, you should love your wives even like you love your own bodies because you don't, people don't hate their bodies, but they take care of their bodies. They nourish and cherish it. So ought men to love their wives. Nourish and cherish, even as Christ nourishes and cherishes the church. In Ephesians chapter 6, when it talks about the fathers and the responsibility of children, Children, obey your parents and the Lord. This is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee. Fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Don't exacerbate them, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The word bring them up means help train them, help to mature them. Psalm 127 says, children are the heritage of the Lord. They belong to God. He's trusted you with his kids. And you have a responsibility. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. Not the way you want him to go. The way the God who gave them to you designed them to go. 
If you men do not love and lead, someone will. Someone will come along and love the girl whose dad didn't love her. But the, the, the heart and the intents of that man may not be honorable. But she will be drawn to anyone that pays attention to her. History is replete with such examples. Every father should remember that one day his son will follow his example rather than his advice. Hear me carefully. We, we all have failed, so I don't, I don't want anyone to feel judged, but hear me carefully. You are setting the pattern that your children will follow. If you bail and run under every pressure, if you cave with every temptation, your sons and daughters will notice that and you will become the standard by which they measure their own success or failure. So first of all, know your responsibility, and second of all, by way of introduction, know your real enemy. It's not the gal sitting next to you. It's not the kids in this room or somewhere else. The real enemy. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Be strong in the Lord. And Ephesians was the church Timothy pastored, so Ephesians was also written to Timothy. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul is peeling back the dimensional veil of time and telling the people in the church of Ephesus, that's the real enemy. He's going to close the curtain pretty soon. You won't always see him but he's always going to be there. There's an enemy that is seeking to steal, to kill, and to destroy your family. That's the real enemy. What do we know about this enemy? We know he's a liar. Jesus said of Satan, he is a liar and the father of liars. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. There is no truth in him. When he speaketh, he speaketh a lie. But he knows how to speak lies, and he knows how to wrap lies in truth. He is the inventor of the phrase divide and conquer. How does he divide the family? Well, that's his goal. He does it spiritually, he does it emotionally, he does it physically. And if he can separate the the point man, the strong man the Bible calls the father, if he can get the family divided so the point man is not involved in the life of his wife and his children, it leaves his wife and children vulnerable as well as him. Because, right, who has his back if he's not around? to the the attacks of Satan. Jesus himself said, every house divided against itself, what's he say? It can't stand. Satan knows this. This is a military term. Divide the leadership, break the communications, and you'll be able to take care of the, the soldiers because you'd separate them from the leaders. In times of warfare, there are three dynamics that take place in the context of these, these units going out through enemy territory. First dynamic is sometimes soldiers don't want to follow the leaders. They just say, I don't like where he's going. I don't agree with him. I think I could do better. And they end up deserting. They say, I'm, I, I, I'm not here. I didn't sign up for this. How many of you have signed up for the military at some point and t- took vows? Did you know everything you were getting into? Often when this happens behind enemy lines, what happens to that deserter? You remember Sergeant Bergdahl? What happened to Sergeant Bergdahl? He got captured. And then what did the Taliban do with Sergeant Bergdahl? They used him for propaganda. In much the same way, Family members can just say, I'm not following the point, man. I, you're not the boss of me. I know what I'm doing. I have my rights. And they begin to drift away. In other words, it's the family that deserts the father. I'm not talking about physical desertion, though that can happen. Can we say runaways? I'm talking about emotionally, practically. I don't care what you say. I'm not going to follow you. And that leaves them, though they may never leave the home. The Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Though they may never leave the home, they decide I'm not going to follow my dad or my mom. I'm 
15, I'm 16, I'm 14, I know what's best. I'm going to follow my friends. And when they get out from under the authority of their parents, whose authority, according to the Bible, are they now under? They think they're under their own authority, but whose authority are they all now under? That's why the Bible says rebellion is like witchcraft. Because it exposes them to Satan's deception and Satan's attacks. And so many end up a spiritual casualty of war. Sometimes the men, the leaders, they desert. They just, uh, they, they may never leave the family, but they check out. They don't engage. They don't lead. They don't even follow. They're just there. They may provide for their family and think that they fulfilled their responsibility, and they are wrong. God does hold the father responsible for providing for the, for the needs of his family, but not just the financial needs of his family. Sometimes point men go astray. That's what happened to my dad when I was six years old. He just left. Left with six bullets in my mom, by the way, but left. Many, I'm talking to many people whose fathers abandoned them emotionally, sometimes physically, and it's painful. I was 21 years old when I learned that my dad had died four years earlier. Didn't even know he was dead. Sometimes the fathers go AWOL. And every time when they do, it leaves their families more vulnerable. More vulnerable to Satan. Jesus said, no man can enter into a strong man's house. Who's the strong man of the house? The man of the house. Nobody's going to go in. If, if I were going to break into your home and try to do damage to your wife and children, any, any prudent criminal would do what first? Would he go after the children first? He would eliminate the father. He would kill him or he would bind him. Here's the tragedy. Satan doesn't kill the dads. He binds them. Binds them to lust, binds them to selfishness, binds them to whatever he binds them to, substance abuse. He's, they're bound. And then he spoils their house. Men, let that soak in. A couple of men come to your home late at night, and you're drunk. And they start ravishing or raping your wife and your children. And you're there, and you see it happen. That's the picture Jesus is using. You can't stop them because you're not dead. You're bound. You're ineffective. That's Satan's plan. Bind the strong man, and then he will spoil. It doesn't say kill the strong man. It says bind him, preoccupy him, immobilize him so that he cannot fight back. That describes the modern American man. Bound by their own self-interest, bound by their own selfishness, bound by their past mistakes and sins so they don't have a clear conscience or they're afraid, I'm not perfect, I've screwed up, it's too late. Hey, may I say it's never too late? Although it's true no one can go back and make a brand new start, my friend, anyone can start from now and make a brand new end. But Satan the liar says it's too late, you can't change it. And sometimes it's not malice, it's not rebellion, it's just carelessness. The point man hadn't been trained and leads his family into an ambush. First Timothy 4, 16, God tells Timothy, take heed to yourself. Watch where you're going. Take heed to the doctrine. Watch what you're teaching, where you're leading. For in doing this, you'll save yourself and them that hear you. We need to take heed. We need to be aware. We need to be careful. We're out there looking at the environment in which our children and our wives are supposed to be following us. And if we're not careful, we're going to step on some landmines. Sometimes it's the children of the wife that rebel, desert emotionally or physically or spiritually their leader. Sometimes it's the leader that checks out. Sometimes it's the leader that's just careless and in, improperly equipped. What did Paul tell Timothy? Find faithful men and do what? Teach them. Teach them how to lead. But at all times, and this is my message, at all times, the point man is the easiest target. Why? Why? One, he's supposed to be in front. Two, if he's even trying to do his job, 
he's going to find the landmines first. Three, he's going to make some mistakes and his family are going to say, I can't trust him. And four, because he's the strong man and Satan's going to try to bind him. Point men are under attack. If I'm leading, and let's put our minds in Nam or Afghanistan or some other place in modern warfare, I'm, I'm the point man and I got a gun and I'm out there looking for enemies, but what if someone behind me's got a gun pointed on me? Is that where I'm looking? Can we say not so friendly fire? Point men are most vulnerable to the attacks that come from within, from the people that they're supposed to be leading. Sometimes people in their own unit, knowingly or unknowingly, not sometimes, not by malice or rebellion, just by carelessness, they get caught up. They, they listen to the enemy's propaganda. Isn't that what happened to Bird Dog? Listen to the enemy's propaganda, and it starts to change the way they think. So sometimes we can begin to cooperate with the enemy whose goal is to what? Divide and conquer. There are many forces at work seeking to sabotage the father and his family unit. I want to give you a couple, of, really only one primary example of that in our culture. I, came, I went to Washington, D.C. last week, and I learned this. And I, I was in D.C. I walked around D.C. I saw some of the museums. I saw some of the women's stuff that they're doing in protest to, to our uh, current administration. And I listened to a man who has a ministry called Mary. It's a website you can look up. And he's a specialist in American families. And he came and did one of the presentations. And he shared this with me. And it was so outrageous, I couldn't believe it. And I've learned not to believe everything someone tells me. So I researched it for myself. I read the article he referenced, and it's absolutely accurate. In, the home, in a New York City home in the 60s, the organization, National organization of, organization of Women, was founded. It was founded for lots of reasons. Some of it was a reaction to weak men who had deserted family and hurt women. The woman who wrote this article and revealed that had been hurt by a man, and she came back to America as a single mom. mom. Her sister, who was one of the first chairperson of now, part of the organization this meeting, her sister said, why don't you come move in? We're starting a movement. So this girl moved in with her sister, and she was now her singer mom. And, and so she had been wounded by men, so she was kind of open, and she attended this first meeting where now was conceived. And she wrote about this meeting. Her sister was Kate Millett. At the time she moved in, she was writing her doctoral thesis called Sexual Politics. And Kate was one of the leaders, one of the co-founders of the National Organization of Women. That's her picture. These early meetings, her, her sister Betty said, what happened was beyond the pale. I couldn't believe it. And she recorded it. And this is what she said. It was like a catechism. And she said she had gone to Columbia University. She had been overseas. She understood how to indoctrinate people. They were taught in Columbia University in education how to indoctrinate people. And it's, it's kind of a catechism. You ask questions, but you, you program the answer. And this is the questions that were asked of the girls, that, the ladies who met at this meeting. Betty would ask, or not Betty, Kate would ask, why are we here today? This is a meeting of a, a handful of women. Why are we here today? Their answer, we're here to make a revolution. What kind of revolution are we wanting to make? This is in the 60s. This is the birthplace of the National Organization of Women. A cultural revolution. What were the 60s known for, by the way? How do we make a cultural revolution? How are we going to accomplish this? We're going to destroy the American family. Look it up. That's what they said. National Organization of Women founding meeting. Why are we here? We're here to destroy the family. How are we going to destroy the family? Does anyone have goosebumps? Because isn't that Satan's goal? I don't think these people were demon-possessed. I think they were reacting against some men who who had hurt them. They had gotten bitter. Bitterness, and the word bitter and the word rebellion are the same root word in the, in the language of the Bible, mara. Bitterness produces rebellion. How do we destroy the family? Anyone want to venture a guess to that answer, to that catechism? By destroying the American patriarch, the American father. We are going to take down men. 
How do we destroy the American patriarch? This was 50, 50, almost 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 50, about 50 or 60 years ago. How do we destroy the American patriarch? By taking away his power. All right, what is the responsibility of the point man? Lead. We got to get him out of leadership. We got to take away his power. How do we do that? This is the question, the catechism, the indoctrination, and these dutiful students are answering, and I'm assuming they had the answers written out because this is what her sister revealed in that meeting, by destroying monogamy. What's monogamy? One man, one woman for life. We're going we're gonna to attack monogamy. If you read the writings of Kate, you will find that she said things like, a married woman is a prostitute to one man. Why prostitute yourself to one man? If you're going to be a prostitute, why not enjoy many men? She wrote it. Sexual politics. How can we destroy monogamy? Notice her answer. By promoting promiscuity, eroticism, prostitution, and homosexuality. Fifty years, that was the founding meeting of the National Organization of Women. Now, I do not believe for a moment that the half a million women who are the members of the National Organization of Women even know this. I don't think they even know it. I don't believe most of them even agree with it. But that was at the core of what, is the, the, what we understand to be the women's liberation movement. Were there bad men? Yes, there were bad men. Were there wounded women? Yes, there were wounded women. But this is what Satan was able to hijack. If you understand that, these types of societal attacks on manhood have caused most men to do what? Can we not honestly say very few men are, are trying to resist this movement? They're just trying to keep out of the way. Keep out of the line of fire. Back away, be quiet, don't want to be politically incorrect, don't want to upset, upset women. They withdraw into confusion, I don't understand, or cowardness. I don't want to take the heat. And the results are devastating. Paul said, beware. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware, lest anyone spoil you. How? Through full. And spoil is a military term. It's the, same, it's the same concept as Jesus said. What happens if you bind the strong man? What are you going to do to his house? You're going to spoil his house. You're going to attack. You're going to ravage. You're going to destroy those that he loved. Paul says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, or in this case women, not after Christ, with devastating results. How, ha how have they accomplished? I mean, th they told us what their goals are. Since the 60s, what's happened? In the, in the 60s, basically, generally, is not, not exclusively, but generally, when a man and a woman were married, they were married, and they, that, that was their sexual experience, their wedding night. That has changed today. The average is, I've already had five different men or women sexually before I get married. What was one of their goals? To destroy the strong man? Destroy monogamy. Promote promiscuity. This is how many men are married in America from the 50s to 2010. You can see in the 50s about between basically 80 and 90% of adult men were married in America. Look at it now. Now it's less than 70%. What's happening? Men don't want to get married. Why don't men want to get married? No, they don't mind shacking up. They don't mind living together. They like the privileges. Of well, why don't men want to get married? Tell me. They don't want the responsibility. That's part of their, that plan. Uh, I, could, I could spend the rest of the well, I'm already out of time, but I could spend a lot of time showing you, but you can look up by almost every measure what happened to family and men since the 60s. Divorce rates, since 1960, notice how they started creeping up. Female head of household, in other words, dad's gone. Look what happened since the 60s, started screaming up. Incarcerated American, most of which are men, look what happened since the 60s. Births to unmarried mothers, the top one, look what happened to the 60s. What was their goal? Promiscuity, prostitution, uh, eroticism, and homosexuality. What we are seeing 50 years after the seeds were planted is what we're reaping.
Be not deceived, Galatians 6 says, God is not mocked. Whatever we sow, we're going to reap. If we sow as a culture, a hatred of men, a distrust of men, a, a vehemence of men, children who grow up without a father five times. I, I showed that video. I'm not going to belabor this point. There's no contradicting the reality that fatherless families suffer. Again, lots of statistics. The reality is men are under attack, and no rational person can deny that. It's hard to be a man. Harder to be a man in 2019 than it was in 1969, 1979, 1989. Our culture has changed. This is a, I had to be careful about these pictures, the women's marches in Washington. There was one not long ago because they're filthy. Some of you heard about the kind of hats they were wearing. Some of you heard the speeches of some of these politicians. Nasty as we want to be, women's place, revolution, stop the war on choice. He's not my president. Sisterhood over patriarchy. Does that sound familiar? Abortion is my human right. This is what's becoming characteristic of the women of America. And part of it is because, well, part of it is because the men have gone AWOL and they're selfish and preoccupied. Part of it is because the women have taken, filled the void left by masculine leadership and there's a battle between the sexes. Gentlemen, you are God's point man. That's what God's called you if you're a father. You're his point man. Question is not whether you are or not. You are. Amen. Question is, where are you pointing? Where are you leading your family? 1942, General Douglas MacArthur was named the National Father of the Year. Do you think in 2019 they would choose a military general as Father of the Year? No. Times were different then, were they not? When he accepted the award, he said, by profession, I'm a soldier and take pride in that fact, but I am infinitely prouder to be a father. While the hordes of death are mighty, remember, this is the World War II. He was in charge of the Pacific Theater. While the hordes of death are mighty. Doesn't sound very politically correct, did it? <laughs> the battalions of life are mightier still. It is my hope that my son, when I am gone, will remember me not for the battle or the war in which I was a key figure, but in the home repeating with him our daily prayer, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Amen. He wrote this poem to his son. It is a prayer, really. Build me a son, O Lord, who will be strong enough to know when he's weak brave enough to face himself when he's afraid, one who'll be proud and unbending and honest defeat and humble and gentle in victory. Isn't that powerful? Amen. Build me a son whose wishes will not take the place of deeds, a son who will know thee, and that to know himself is the foundation of stone of knowledge. Lead him, I pray, not in the path of ease and comfort. Lots changed in 70 years, isn't it? We don't want our little boys to have any problems and hardships. We want to bail them out of every little situation. He said, God, don't make it easy on him. But under the stress and spur of difficulties and challenge. Why would a father pray that for his son? Because he's trying to develop, develop character and integrity and a spine in him. Here, that's under stress and difficulties, let him learn to stand up in the storm. Here, let him learn compassion for those who fail. Amen. Build me a son whose heart will be clear, whose goal will be high, a son who will master himself before he seeks to master any men, other men. That's a good challenge for us fathers, isn't it? We want to lead others. How are we doing on mastering ourselves and our own passion, our own pride, our own selfishness? Before he seeks to master other men. One who will reach into the future and yet never forget the past. And after all these things are his, I pray thee add enough uh, sense of humor 
so that he may always be serious but never take himself too seriously. Give him humility that he may always remember the simplicity of true greatness, the open mind of true wisdom, the meekness of true strength. Then I, his father, will dare to whisper, I have not lived in vain. My kids asked me, they didn't ask me this year because they know the answer. What do you want for Father's Day? They didn't ask me this year. They've asked me many times in the past. I always give them the same answer. Obedient children. 1867, Alfred Nobel was a Swedish chemist. They had nitroglycerin before then, but what do we know about nitroglycerin? Unstable. So he found a way to stabilize nitroglycerin and created dynamite. That was one of hundreds of patents. He was a brilliant young man. He did it primarily for mining, but looking at warfare, this is what he wrote. My dynamite will lead to peace. When people understand the power of dynamite, they won't want to go to war. They'll find ways to get along. Did that work out? No, it didn't. In 1888, he picked up a French newspaper and was shocked to read his own obituary. It was not him, but his brother who had died, but the French paper got it wrong. The obituary was not kind to Mr. Nobel. He described him in terms of being the merchant of death. So Alfred Nobel, he's now maybe 60, reading his own obituary and reading what people think about his discovery. Now, in reality, he had 330, 30, 335 different inventions, but he was remembered for one, the most destructive. Now, is it, can dynamite be constructive? Can be useful? Absolutely. Can fire be constructive and destructive at the same time? Can sex be constructive and destructive at the same time? Can power be constructive and destructive at the same time? Absolutely. That's why MacArthur prayed that God would give his son wisdom, knowing that his son would become a man of influence, at least in his family. He looked at his own obituary and said, is that how I want to be remembered? And what, do you think he, what conclusion do you think he drew? No. I'm an old man, but I do not want to be, I don't want this to be my Legacy. We've been talking about legacy over the last number of weeks. I don't want this to be my legacy. So what did he do? He spent 94% of his wealth to create a foundation that we now know as the Nobel Peace Prize. So when people hear the name Nobel, do they think about dynamite? No, they think about something completely different. Here's my point, dads. One of the best books I've ever written, read, <laughs> never written a book. <laughs> Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Stephen Covey in that book, one of those habits is begin with an end in view. Well, we've already begun. Most of us are already there. And we lose sight of the end in view. And in that story, he, he, in that book, he talks about attending a funeral. And you know everybody in the, in the, in the church. And in fact, you look in the front row, it's the pe your own family, and, and you realize it's your funeral you're attending. He says, and you're listening to people talk about you. You're listening to what you're going to be remembered by. That left a mark in my life. I never forgot that. What, who's going to be at my funeral? Those are the people that are the most important to me, right? Those are the people that matter, especially those people in the front. Who's going to be at my funeral? What do I want them to remember me by? That's my legacy. Most of us can look back and realize we've made a lot of mistakes. We've stepped on a lot of landmines. We've hurt our families. We've let them down. We've not been the leader or the lover that we should have been. And the devil wants to accuse us and say, you have no right. Don't even try. Disengage. Let mama take care of them. And too many of us have done that in too many ways. I'm here to hold up before you your obituary. I'm not writing it. You've already written it. I'm here to ask you to look at it. You read it. You know what it says. And if that's not what you want to be remembered by, then I encourage you to do what the Bible says. Remember from whence thou art fallen, repent. And go back and do the first things that you need to be doing. Accept your responsibility to lead and to love. 
How do we change our legacy? Accept our responsibility. Recognize the enemy. Next week, we're going to talk about getting equipped. But I want you to help me with this. I've already done this, but it may not be the best. I want you, and it's in your notes. If you didn't get them, pick them up. If there are no more, let me know. I'll get them to you. I want you to spend some time, especially men, but kids and wives, what do you want your point man to be like? How can he sharpen his ability to lead your family? What letter, starting with P, I, I know this is not perfect, but I want you to think about it. Think about what starts with P. Power, do you want your point man just to be a powerhouse? Maybe you do. Patient. Patient. Now, and that's what I'm asking you. You look at your family, your situation, and you fill in. I, want, I, I think P is important. What about O? Obstinate, objective, open, observant. What about I? Intelligent, is that really that important? Intimate, invested. Would you help me preach next, next week's lesson? Would you send me, you fill it out and you email it. I may use yours, I may use some of your, I've already done this and I have some ideas, but I'm praying that God would help me to guide us and to how to be more effective. How to pray for our fathers, how to love our husbands, our fathers. And, and for me to fulfill what God told me my responsibility is, find faithful men, men who are willing to step up and teach them. So I'm asking you to help me teach them. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Before God, I'm